Okay, so we're finally going to start talking about mixed models. Um, of course, the title is random effects, which is the inclusion of effects that are non-fixed in a model, hence the name mixed models. Um, <laughs> a curious quote from Gary, what a strange world we live in, said Alice to the Queen of Hearts. He puts this up here because let's look at our assumptions we made up until this point in this course. So everything we've done up until now has dealt with fixed effects. Uh, the treatment effect, when we have a fixed effect model, is unknown, of course. We don't know what they're going to be, but they're going to be constants, or they are constants. If we ran the experiment again, we'd expect, you know, more, we'd expect the same treatment effects. Um, we can increase the power of our test to one by just making the sample size bigger. We actually did spent a lot of time talking about that last week. We can make inference on the alphas, those fixed effects, and we can do that by the F test or the T test. Um, all of this we've been assuming up until now. And now um, we're going to start talking about random effects where each of these statements is no longer true. So let's talk about why, okay, and how. Random effects models look very similar to fixed effects. In fact, uh, when we write them out as a linear model, they look no different. So here's a one-way model, this could be fixed or random. Factorial model, fixed or random. The difference is in the assumptions we make about these effects, the alphas and the betas. For fixed effects, the alphas and betas are constants, okay? They're, they're constant values that we know add to zero, where, um, you know, we could have other constraints as we talked about. Random effects, however, are random values. They follow a distribution, um, typically normal. Um, it doesn't have to be normal, by the way, but that's what we assume almost all the time. Um, the effects are going to be independent of the random effects, the epsilons in, in the model, and the betas, and so on. We usually assume that our random effects uh, within a given term are independent of each other as well. Um, this actually doesn't have to be the case, though. We can do more complicated mixed models where we have covariation between these effects as well. So in fixed effects models at the top, we always assumed that we had a homogeneous variance across all uh, effect levels and that those yi's are independent, so we had no kind of dependency structure among the responses in our experiment. We're going to change things up a little bit with random effects now. Now we're going to say that the, um, the variance is not homogeneous across all effect levels, but in fact it can vary according to the random effect. This is with a single random effect model, by the way. And this affects our correlation structure. So for any two yij's, if i is equal to k, Okay, meaning they are in the same, this would in, imply that they are within the same random effect level, or what we would have called in the past treatment level, then it's zero. So we're saying, um, I'm sorry, I not equal to K, they're not in the same treatment level, then it's zero. And so we're saying that these have no, um, no, um, correlation because they exist within different levels of our random factor. The opposite of that is 1, where everything is equal. So notice if i equals k and j equals l, we have really the same observation, so 1. But in the middle, we get this thing called an intraclass correlation coefficient, which occurs for any two observations that are within the same level of a random effect. Um, sometimes, this has to do with maybe um, uh, actual physical structure. For example, you could imagine if you're doing a study of all of our sections of Calculus 1, 1411, here on campus, that there may be a certain correlation of student learning outcomes for each instructor. So you might say, our random effect is instructor here, and we believe that students within a certain instructor's class will be more alike. And this measure here, this intraclass correlation, would be that measure of how dependent those students are, or how alike those students are within an individual instructor's class. So when they're in the same instructor, I equal J, 
or I equal K, but they're different students, J not equal to L, we expect some kind of dependency. But when they're in different instructor's class, we maybe don't see that dependency. Okay? Um, this also is com sometimes, if you're from a biology background, is called uh, heritability because this um, is used commonly to look at dependencies and outcome measures for offspring from a parent or a lineage. So fixed effects. Our interest and our inference is all about those alpha eyes, those treatment effects. We're not going to be so concerned about the treatment effects when we have random effects models. We're going to actually focus in on the variance. So that variance contributed by our random effect. Sometimes when we do predictions, we will look at the alpha eyes though. That's the only time I really look at them. Sometimes I'll look at a plot of, well, we'll see if I do that. But usually just if I do the predictions, I think about those alpha eyes. The variances that alpha, sigma squared alpha are called our components of variance or variance components. Um, this is a really important way to think about splitting up your heterogeneity of your responses in an experiment. And we're going to spend a lot of time thinking about this in this class because I think often people overlook this and don't think about how they can control heterogeneity better by using random effects in a model. So why in the world do we introduce this new idea of random effects and, and why do we need a random effect? For, why can't we just treat everything like a fixed effect and go on as we have been and not worry about this whole idea of mixed modeling? Um, well, there are some assumptions and I have a general rule of thumb that I use when I'm deciding whether or not an effect in a model is going to be a fixed or a random effect. Um, let's see what Gary says and then I'll add my two cents. Okay, so he says fixed effects um, are unchanging. So the treatments are the treatments, and they don't change. So you think of it this way. If you're looking at, um, say, looking at a fertilizer and looking at different amounts of fertilizer and its effect on, on yield of corn, okay? Um, if you're going to rerun that experiment, you'll probably try, if you were going to theoretically rerun it, you'd probably try the same experimental levels for your fertilizer or combinations or whatever it is. And you could fully replicate that again. All right. So this idea that the treatments are what they are and they, they don't need to be, uh, they can be set for replications of the experiment. Versus in random effects, there are levels of a treatment that are, you should think of as a sample from a population of potential treatments. So I already brought up the example of doing a study on our Math 1411. We have a lot of lecturers in the department. Anytime we assign lecturers in the math department to teach 1411, it's out of a large pool of all possible math lecturers. And so if we were to do a study in the fall semester and then do a study in the next fall semester, we probably could not replicate exactly the same levels of instructors um, because instructors come and go, um, availability changes, and so forth. And so if we were to rerun that experiment, we would not be seeing exactly the same treatments in a case like that. And we'd be looking at a new sample, potentially. Maybe there's some overlap, but it would not be the same. And our inferences back in a fixed effects experiment, our inference is all about those effects, because we're assuming the treatments are fixed. But in a random effects experiment, we actually make our inference back on to that population of treatments. So if I had my random effects for the instructor, so the effect of the instructor on student learning in Calculus 1, I'd say, okay, there's this much heterogeneity due to instructor. And maybe that was too high out of, you know, the total breakdown of variation in student learning outcomes in Calculus 1. And so we think, well, we need to have a little bit more uh, quality control <laughs> of our instructors and think a little bit more about how to make it more systematic and uniform across sections. So we use random effects models in cases when we have treatment sampled from a population. Okay, so this might be litters from a population of 
pigs, <laughs> pigs, I don't think you call them litters, right? Um, or teachers from a population of teachers or um, uh, samples, food samples from a population uh, from big batches of food. The treatments are supposed to represent a population of treatments about which we want to know something. And those patterns, those sampling pr patterns in the collection um, of units have some sort of similarities or correlations or dependence among the units that can be modeled. So just like we said, we, we thought, well, you know, students within one section of calculus may be more alike than different due to the effect of the instructor. Well, similarly, chocolate from a certain batch may be more alike um, or samples from a certain batch of chocolate may be very similar, whereas if you sampled from another batch of chocolate, it may be quite different. All right, so that's your general um, introduction to random effects and the why behind them. Next time we'll get more into the technical details.